Nicole van den Herk was born on July 4, 1980, in Ergelands, a town with just over 43,000 inhabitants in Germany. She was the daughter of Angelica Tegmeier, a single mother who, in addition to her, had another son named Andy, who was five years older than Nicole. Nicole was a result of an extramarital relationship. Her father, who was a friend of her mother, was already married and had another family. Prior to that, Nicole's mother wasn't sure who her father was, and she only found out a year after her daughter was born, after a DNA test. Thus, the girl was raised only by her mother, and according to sources, her father, even later having knowledge of the paternity, was not present in her life. Shortly thereafter, her mother met a Dutchman named Ed van den Herk, with whom she began a relationship, and later the two married and moved to Edenhoven, the Netherlands. The man ended up getting attached to his companion's children and decided to give them his last name. It is said that in the first year, Angelica's relationship with her new companion was peaceful, but over time, some problems began to arise, due to Angelica being a very difficult person to live with. According to sources, Angelica suffered from mental problems and used to have behaviors that greatly affected her relationship with her husband. Due to this, the couple's relationship began to fray, and in 1989, they divorced. As Angelica suffered from mental problems, she was deemed incapable of taking care of the children, and custody of them ended up with her partner. Over the years, Angelica became increasingly depressed and feeling aimless and alone. In April 1995, she decided to take her own life. This event shook both Nicole and her half-brother Andy. Their relationship with their stepfather was no longer very good, as the man was always traveling for work and the two brothers had to be under the care of his mother. In the meantime, Ed had met another woman, with whom he began a relationship. But despite the family gaining a new member, things haven't changed, as Andy and Nicole's stepfather's new companion was also very absent. Nicole was described as a very polite, hardworking and responsible girl. In 1995, at the age of 15, she got a job at a grocery store that was a few blocks from her home. She went to school in the morning and to work in the afternoon. According to friends and family, the young woman was very happy with the job she had gotten and liked to feel little independent. In October 1995, Nicole was on the school vacation and started working at the grocery store in the morning. The girl's goal was to work all her vacation in the morning so that she would have the afternoon free and could help her grandmother with the household chores, among other things. And when her school holidays were over, she would go back to work life in the afternoon. On October 6th, Nicole got dressed in the morning, had breakfast, got on her bike, and headed to work. After a few minutes, she didn't arrive at work, so her boss was surprised at the fact that the girl was not one to be late. Worried, he decided to call the young woman's home, but no one answered the call. He then contacted the police and explained the whole situation. Police went to Nicole's grandmother's house, but the girl was not there and no one knew her whereabouts. At around 6 p.m., police officers searching the area for the girl found her bicycle at the bottom of a river called Domel. The authorities then focused their search on that river. They scored the place for hours, but nothing but the young woman's bicycle was found. In the days that followed, the police broadly investigated Nicole's disappearance. They also asked anyone who had any information that could lead them to the girl to come forward. The young woman's disappearance mobilized the entire community. Something like that was not common there. And many people offered to help the police in whatever was necessary. After a few days went by without any leads or traces of Nicole, the police began to consider the possibility that the girl had run away and gone to the house of relatives in Germany. However, the girl's stepfather rebuted his theory and said that Nicole had no reason to run away. He asked the police to continue with the search, saying he believed that the young woman had been taken against her will by someone. The cops even questioned Nicole's brother Andy, who told them he didn't know where his sister was. The girl's boyfriend, whose name, photo or age I couldn't find, was also questioned and also said he didn't know her whereabouts. The authorities, with the help of some volunteers, continued the search. On October 17th, 
they search another river in the nearby forest, and two days later, on October 19, they found Nicole's backpack near the Edenhoven Canal, a few kilometers from where her bicycle had been found. Due to this clue, the police focused their searches on this area, but nothing other than the girl's backpack was found. On October 24th, a man called the police saying he knew who was responsible for Nicole's disappearance and claimed that the girl was already dead. However, the call was cut off before the man could give more details or identify himself. The cops thought he could call again, but he didn't, and even though they recorded every call, at that time, they still didn't have a caller ID. Between the 28th and the 29th of October, a major search was carried out in nearby areas. The search lasted hours and involved hundreds of police, volunteers, and sniffer dogs, but no trace of the young woman was found. The police officers continued to investigate and received almost 300 leads regarding the case. These clues ranged from the girl's supposed location to theories that she was in the Middle East against her will. The most coherent clues were even checked by the police, but they didn't help at all. On November 22, 1995, a man who was hiking in the forest located near the city of Mirello saw something strange in the middle of the woods. When approaching, he could see that it was a human body. The man, very scared, ran to a nearby town and warned the authorities. The police officers who went to the scene already suspected that the body could belong to Nicole, and after a brief forensic examination, they confirmed this. According to the autopsy report, Nicole had head and finger injuries, her jaw was fractured and there was a perforation in the rib region caused by a sharp object with a blade. Police did a thorough search of the place where the body was found, for the murder weapon or any other evidence, but they found nothing. For them, due to the state of the body, the young woman had her life taken on the first day she disappeared. News that the young woman's body had been found quickly spread across the country. Not only her family, but also the people who followed the case were shocked. As I mentioned before, this kind of thing was not common to happen there and it was something that really moved the local community. Nicole von der Herck's funeral took place on November 28 and was attended by thousands of people. It is said that people from all over the Netherlands attended the ceremony, and even though most didn't know the young woman personally, they offered their condolences. In January 1996, the police released to the public a recording of the call from the man who had called them last year, saying he knew who was responsible for the crime. The cops were hoping that someone would recognize this man's voice and be able to tell them who it was. The recording of the call was broadcast on national television, but even so, no one contacted the police. In February 1996, an acquaintance of Nicole's stepfather was arrested for selling narcotics. Upon being taken to the police station, she said she was forced to sell by the same man who had taken Nicole's life. The cops found the story very strange but still decided to check it out. It didn't take long to discover that it was all a lie by the woman who tried to get rid of the accusation she had received. In the following months, no news leads on the case emerged, and with that the investigation team that previously had several police officers was reduced to just four. A reward was even offered to anyone who had information about the crime, but even so, the police didn't get anything relevant. The officers who continued on the case found themselves in a dead end, so they decided to turn their attention to Nicole's stepbrother and stepfather. In June 1996, Ed van der Herck and Andy van der Herck were arrested on suspicion of committing the crime. Both were interrogated for hours. The cops were aware of any inconsistency in their statements, and the sleep would be an indication that they really had something to do with the crime. However, their testimonies were consistent and they also had strong alibis. Thus, the two ceased to be suspected and were released. Nicole's boyfriend was also taken in for questioning at the time, but like the victim's stepbrother and stepfather, he also had a good alibi. Time passed, and the police did not get any relevant leads on the case, and everything that emerged was just rumors and speculation. Finally, the police officers who continued the investigation again found themselves in a dead end, and with that, the case was shelved. In 2004, a team specialized in cold cases took over the investigations. Over the course of months, 
they reviewed various reports and talked to a few people who were close to Nicole. They believed they could find something the police had missed and thus advanced the case. The expectation on top of that team was high. Many who followed the case, especially Nicole's family, had hopes that they would actually be able to solve it. But like the first cops who had worked on the case, they also didn't make much progress, and because of that, the case was shelved again. Andy, Nicole's stepbrother, was very affected by what happened to his sister, in fact, the most affected. He had already lost his mother and now his sister, with whom he was very attached. All these traumatic events did a lot of harm to him, and the boy didn't have a healthy growth. Andy developed several psychological problems. He was also seen almost always depressed and used to seek refuge in alcohol. To make matters worse, he kept something with him that he didn't tell anyone about, and it was eating him up inside. Andy suspected that the author of the crime was his stepfather, and because of that, he kind of gradually distanced himself from the man who raised him as a son. He also in no way accepted that his sister's case remained unsolved and was willing to do anything to change that. Andy knew that forensic techniques had evolved a lot since 1995 and believed that through DNA tests, the police could find the person responsible for the crime. But for that, he would need to convince the authorities to exhume his sister's body so they could do analysis for any DNA that was in the girls. He even talked to some police officers about this possibility but they said the process to exhume the body was very bureaucratic, and they were only able to do that if there was a very strong evidence, otherwise it would be almost impossible to get a judicial authorization. It was then that Andy started thinking of a way to make that happen and decided to do something that would put his reputation and freedom at risk. In March 2011, while living in England, Andy made a Facebook post saying that he was responsible for the crime against his half-sister. His post was quickly shared thousands of times and shortly afterwards, the British police arrested him. Andy was extradited to the Netherlands, as that's where the crime took place. He spent five days in police custody and was later released to answer for the crime in freedom, as there was no physical evidence linking him to the case. Despite all the trouble Andy went through, with the arrest and thousands of people judging him, believing he was really responsible for the crime, for him it was well worth it. As strong evidence has now emerged that could solve the case, Dutch authorities decided to exhume Nicole's body to see if they could find traces of DNA that could belong to Andy. The boy was very happy with that. It was a victory after so many years, and he believed that if there was any DNA in Nicole's remains that didn't belong to her, it would certainly be from her stepfather. Meanwhile, Ed van der Herk, Andy's stepfather, unaware of his stepson's plans, gave a statement to the press in which he said he didn't believe the boy was actually responsible for the crime, and that he was just begging for attention. However, a few days later, Ed came back and said that he came to believe that Andy was really responsible for the crime. I haven't found any concrete information as to why the man backed down on his statement, but some sources suggest he had an argument with Andy. Later, as authorities analyzed Nicole's remains for DNA, Andy gave a new interview. In that interview, the boy opened up. He said he firmly believed that his stepfather was responsible for the crime. Asked about the man's motivation for committing the such an act, Andy said he suspected that his stepfather has impregnated Nicole and that therefore he decided to take her life in an attempt to hide everything. Upon learning of these accusations from the stepson, Ed countered them and said that he never thought the boy suspected that he was responsible for something so terrible. He also said that he loved Nicole as if she was his daughter, and that he would never do anything to hurt her. Subsequently, the forensic team that was doing analysis on Nicole's remains decided to send him to New Zealand, where there was a group of scientists who had new technology for extracting DNA. After a few weeks of work, the New Zealand scientists were able to detect and extract three male DNAs from the victim's remains. It can be said that this was one of the greatest advances in investigations during all these years. However, Dutch authorities would still have the difficult task of collecting the DNA of several suspects to compare with the three that were found in Nicole's remains. It took them three years to get this, and even then they were only able to identify two of the three DNAs found. Everyone following the case, including police officers working on it, were pretty sure that one of the DNAs was from the victim's stepbrother or stepfather, 
but none of the DNAs belonged to them. The first DNA identified belonged to Nicole's boyfriend at the time of the events. But that didn't make him responsible for the crime. After all, they were a couple and they lived in physical contact, and he had a strong alibi as I already mentioned. In the second DNA, the police could not identify its owner. The only thing that is known is that it belongs to an adult male. The third DNA made the police on alert. The DNA belonged to a 46-year-old man at the time named Just G, an old acquaintance of the Dutch police. Just G was already being convicted of having forced relations with three women. He was sentenced to three years in prison and compulsory treatment for one of them. In 1995, when the crime took place, he was 27 years old. In April 2014, Just G was arrested on charges of being responsible for the crime. During his interrogation, he denied the crime, but said he knew Nicole and that day before she disappeared, they met and had relations, which he said were consensual. The police obviously didn't believe this story. Nicole was a very responsible girl, and Just G didn't have the profile of a person she would get involved with. Besides, his background already said a lot about the kind of person he was. The cops believed that he had forced relations with the girl and then taken her life. A few days after Just G was arrested, his defense questioned the DNA evidence claiming that there was still unknown DNA and that it could be very well belong to the person responsible for the crime. This ended up causing Just G not to be accused of taking the girl's life, but as he confessed that he had relations with her, the charge of forced relations remained, even though the defense claimed that everything was consensual. On November 2, 2015, the trial of the accused began. The prosecution presented several experts who worked on the case but confirmed that one of the male DNAs that were found in Nicole's remains did indeed belong to the defendant. Afterwards, the prosecution presented two witnesses who claimed that the defendant had confessed to the crime of them years earlier. According to these witnesses, this confession took place in a mental institution where the defendant and these two people were being treated together. On the other hand, the defense stated that these allegations that his client had confessed to the crime were false. According to the defense, the two witnesses were lying that they were only interested in the 15,000 euros reward that the authorities were offering for any information relevant to the case. Regarding the DNA, the defense argued that the samples were poorly preserved as they had been in the victim's remains inside a coffin since 1995. With that, they asked the court to further test to be carried out so that they could have a second opinion and known if in fact your client really had something to do with the crime or not. The prosecution protested, arguing that this was just a ploy to buy them time. But to no avail, the court accepted the defense's request and requested that a new DNA test be carried out and by a different team. Because of this, the trial was stalled and only resumed the following year. In April 2016, the new forensics team presented the results of the new DNA test they had performed in the court. This result pointed out that one of the DNAs found in Nicole's remains actually belonged to Just G. On October 12, 2016, the prosecution demanded that the defendant receive a 14-year prison sentence, stating that the relationship he claimed to have had with Nicole was not consensual. On November 21, Just G was found guilty of the crime, forced intercourse and sentenced to five years in prison. As there was another DNA in Nicole's remains that was never identified, the defense argued that it could belong to the man who actually took the girl's life. Thus, Just G was not accused of the crime. Shortly after the end of the trial, the public ministry appealed the acquittal of the Just G for the crime in which he allegedly took Nicole's life. The appeals process lasted nearly two years, until in October 2018, the accused's acquittal was overturned and he was sentenced to 12 years in prison for the crime. I have not found information on which prison Just G is currently in. Soon after his conviction, friends, relatives, and others who followed Nicole's case celebrated. It was something surreal for them, as many thought the case would not have an outcome. Regarding the DNA of the unknown man that was found in Nicole's remains, police said it's now a database, and if that man is ever arrested, he will be linked to the case. I also didn't find information on whether Andy van der Herk apologized to his stepfather or vice versa because of the exchanges of accusations. According to some sources, they continue to keep in touch, but surely their relationship must have been shaken. 
when it was proven through DNA tests that Andy had nothing to do with the crime, he returned to England. In May 2002, Andy's neighbors were surprised that the man hadn't left his apartment for a few days, something they said was unusual. They then informed the police that they went to the scene. The cops knocked and knocked the door several times but no one answered. With that, they decided to break down the apartment door to gain access to its interior. When they entered, they smelled a very strong smell and when they entered Andy's room, they found the man already lifeless on top of his bed. In the room, there was an enormous amount of prescription drugs and bottles of alcoholic beverages. Later, a toxicologic test showed a large amount of alcohol and medication in Andy's blood, which according to coroners, caused him to have a heart attack. And so was the end of the man who risked his own freedom to solve the case of the stepsister he loved so much. The news of his death came as a shock to everyone following the case. We can say that Andy was a hero, not only for taking a risk to solve the half-sister's case, but also for helping to take a highly dangerous criminal off the streets. The case of Nicole von der Herk was one of the most talked about and famous in the Netherlands. To this day, it is a reason for debate by people who followed it. The place where the young woman's body was found had become a kind of shrine where people usually leave flowers and candles and pray for her to rest in peace. Well, folks, that's it. Thank you so much for watching until the end. Best wishes, and I see you next time.